thanks. Yeah, um, it's great to be here. Nice to see a, a large audience and lots of young people. That's what we always like. Um, I don't want to talk too much because I can tell that there are lots of people here who are really interested in these subjects and know a lot about them. So it's probably better if what I do is kind of throw in a few of my ideas and be a bit provocative. And then, you know, rather than you asking questions and me answering those questions, we can have a sort of exchange and see where we come to together, really, because... What I'm going to try and do is focus us on some of the most important issues as I see it. It's Climate Change Week, and um, I'm a green economist. So, you know, putting those two things together, I think we know the sort of ballpark we're in, and it's some of the most important issues facing us as a human community, really. And um, I hope we can, we can all share our ideas about what we should be doing and, and positive ways forward, and perhaps also some of the blockages and how we might overcome those. So... Right, I've chosen this rather ambitious title. I chose that about a year ago, so I hope I've still got something relevant to say, but we'll see how it goes. I'm actually going to start my talk in a place that, that makes me feel quite uncomfortable, and that's the announcement last week that the cooperative group has decided to sell off its farms. No doubt that also caused pain to some other people in the room. Now, a lot of people are probably unaware of the fact that the cooperative group even owned any farms, but it actually manages a total estate in excess of 70,000 acres, and it's the largest farmer in Britain. And for me, that's always been a sort of proud boast as somebody who's part of the cooperative movement and has written a lot about co-ops, that actually the, the largest farm estate in the country is the cooperative farms. And that's still the case, but they are now one of the first parts of the group that it's going to sell off as it faces this financial difficulty. I think what was particularly sad about the decision to sell off the farms was the fact that some of the cooperative managers actually used words like peripheral to refer to the farms, and they dismissed current co-op members' attachment to them as sentimental. I'm tempted to suggest that this is rather like suggesting that your connection to food is sentimental, but you know, I'll, I'll keep those kind of remarks about the importance of food until a little bit later. In 2010, I wrote a paper with a, a colleague who's an, another cooperator, Richard Bickle, called The Cooperative Path to Food Security. And in that paper, I pointed to the increasing volatility of global food prices as speculators moved their, their global gambling activity away from financial products in the wake of the crisis and into commodities markets. Charities working with the poor from the Global South are increasingly focusing on the link between poverty, land ownership, and control over food supplies. And unless we take this seriously, it seems to me that our very daily bread itself might become subject to the same forces, speculative forces of extortion that have destroyed our banks and left us with the politics of austerity. So, in my approach to economics, this decision by the cooperative group that the shops are worth saving and that the farms can be lost links very closely to a decision that was made back in the summer, which again passed without much comment. And that was the fact that a, a farming minister at cabinet level was removed and not replaced. And George Eustace, who took this position, was not at cabinet level. So that, what I see as deeply fundamental to an economy, the production of food, the, the farming brief, is no longer represented at cabinet level in this country. To me, this suggests that a political decision has been taken that farming is just no longer significant in our country. And I'd like to spend the time that I've got with you this evening exploring how we might have got ourselves into a position where that could be considered to be the case, because I think it links quite closely to why we're finding it so hard to deal with the environmental crisis. And I see the connection as being that basic disconnect between ourselves and the land. And that's really my, my work in economics is to try and reconnect us to the land. I would like to propose that we begin to develop ideas for what I'm calling a regenerative economy. And to do that, I will spend some time looking at what the government might mean when it talks about rebalancing the economy, a phrase that's become very popular in recent years. But I don't think I mean the same thing by it that... Uh, George Osborne does. So this is the, the three sections I'm going to be covering. Firstly, a little bit about what I mean by a climate-changed world. That's a phrase that I first heard being used by John Barry, who's also just got a chair, hurrah, um, at Queen's University Belfast. And um, 
yeah, I mean, I think we're already living in this climate changed world. And it's not primarily, when I think of that phrase, about what's happening with the weather. It's about the way we live socially and the changes we're making as human communities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then I'm going to move on and spend some time thinking about food sovereignty and land ownership. And in this area, I know there's a huge amount of expertise here, so there'll probably be a lot of people in the room that know more about that part than I do. But I'll tell you why I think it's important as an economist. And lastly, I'll spend a bit of time thinking about rebalancing the economy. So given that it is um, climate change week, I don't think we'd be happy unless we had one graphic about climate change, and this is the one. If you're only going to use one graphic about climate change, this is the one to choose. It's based on work by Reto Knutti and Marcus Huber from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And what they're doing is combining... I'm going to read you what they say they're doing, but it's so complicated I couldn't possibly put it in my own words. It's combining the possible natural causes of climate change with and without carbon emissions to see which better matches the observed temperature readings. So... Here's the natural systems that might impact on the temperature, things like volcanic and solar changes. And with the red line, they've added in um, the impact we're having through our economic activity, so greenhouse gases, sulfates, and ozone. And then they compare both of those with the observations of temperature we've actually seen. And the point of the graphic is to say, that the red and black lines are a very close match and the blue one is nowhere close. So to me, this is kind of, I mean, people say, do you believe in climate change? It's not a question of whether you believe in climate change. The observations are there. There is, for some people, a question about whether it's human activity. And to me, this graphic answers that question, right? This is what they say they're doing. Simulated contributions from human caused or anthropogenic and natural forcing agents to the total observed global temperature change relative to the 1850 to 1900 average. Short-term variations are, oh yeah, anyway, short-term variations are a result from El Nino. But anyway, that, that's what they've done. And that, I've tweeted that graphic recently because I think it's kind of, to me, this, this is case closed. You know, we, we've got to stop arguing about this and move on to, to dealing with it, and urgently so. Um, yeah, I just put that here there so people could have a laugh about it. I mean, we've all experienced this, haven't we? You know, you're you're sitting there in the studio or on the radio arguing about climate change and they bring in some complete buffoon who knows nothing about it and they're somehow allowed to, to argue with you just because they hold a different point of view. This is the rather strange way in which the BBC interprets what it means to have a balanced debate about climate change. You know, you're, you're the sort of informed science person and there's a complete nutter on the other side. Oh, I knew I'd say something that'll have to be cut out of the filming and that was just one thing. Um, anyway, this has been tweeted on by Rob Hopkins just to cheer us all up when we find ourselves in that sort of situation where you're having to debate with somebody that knows nothing. And in the case of um, Nigel Lawson, is actually deeply entrenched in the whole need to protect his own carbon-related assets. And that's what we're seeing now, that people who have a lot of their own cash invested in assets that depend on us not doing anything about climate change because they're oil companies or something like that. That's why they've come out fighting. Okay, so I don't know how many of you know I'm actually standing to be elected as an MEP down in the southwest at the moment, so I'm kind of on the stump, and that actually makes it a bit difficult to, to think deep intellectual thoughts, I've got to tell you, because you're constantly changing everything into a little soundbite. Um, so I am suffering from that at the moment, but I'm also having to go around and be in the right place at the right time. So this is me in Dawlish the day after the railway line fell into the sea. And uh, actually, right down that end of the platform is the Transport Minister, Patrick McLaughlin. I tried really hard to get down there and um, ask him, does your government now think climate change is happening? But they, you know, there was a lot of guys like that, so I couldn't do it, unfortunately. But um, anyway, to me, this is a perfect demonstration of the fact that we don't have resilient systems. And um, I'm going to read a little bit now from a, a chapter that I wrote about resilient food systems, just to describe what I think resilience is all about. So um, the concept of resilience arises from the field of engineering, where resilience is, is calculated as the amount of energy that can be elastically stored per unit volume of a material that is deformed. In other words, the concept is used to express the amount of stress that can be withstood before a material will either break or fail to return to its original form. Ecologists have extended the concept to inform understanding of how complex and interrelated ecosystems respond to external shocks, and in particular, to assess how much disturbance they can withstand 
before moving to an adapted state of equilibrium. In the psychological literature, resilience takes on a more dynamic meaning, referring to the potential of the human psyche to bounce back from damaging life experiences. Although the events may be undesirable, it is a mark of a healthy psychology to be able to respond positively. So, so that's, that's a kind of extension of an engineering term into the fields of ecology and psychology. And it's also interestingly been extended now in terms of thinking about actual national security. So in that sort of context, David Omand, who is the UK's intelligence and security coordinator, defined resilience as the capacity to absorb shocks and to bounce back into functioning shape, or at the least to prevent stress fractures or even system collapse. This sort of definition has been used explicitly in connection with food security. So the direct dependence of communities on ecosystems is an influence on their social re resilience and ability to cope with shocks, particularly in the context of food security and coping with hazards. Now, John Barry, who I just mentioned earlier, uses the concept of resilience a lot in his work, and he suggests that it will become an overriding virtue and concern of individual communities, economies, and systems of production and consumption as we move towards the climate changed and carbon constrained world of the 21st century and beyond. However, he doesn't see this, and neither do I, as a negative response to the failure of current systems. It's rather quite an inspiring way of looking for a positive alternative. It's thinking about resilience as a capacity to be a necessary part of what it means to be a healthy, human person and a healthy human community. But as we can see from what happened at Dawlish, it, this is quite extraordinary. You know, the, I mean, I, I live in the southwest, so this main line to one of our most important cities, Plymouth, is cut off. The bus service is absolutely appalling, and we're not even sure when this railway line is going to be reinstated. So I think it's extraordinary that the low level of sort of concern on a national basis about this. I mean, you can imagine what, happen, what would happen if the rail line from London to Manchester was cut or something like that. I know Plymouth isn't quite as significant as Manchester, but it's certainly significant in my part of the world. And it's actually not possible to get there by public transport at the moment. Um, so, you know, we've proved that we don't have resilience. And I've been debating this a bit with MPs. And when I say to them, oh, look, the, the system wasn't resilient at all, they say, well, that's okay because the crisis has come and we're going to sort that out now. But that, that's exactly what's not going to be any good with climate change, because there's going to be crises coming. We need to be prepared for them. We need to have different sorts of systems that aren't vulnerable to those sudden shocks. And, uh, you know, you hear the word, well, Jill and I were talking about this, you hear the word resilience used a lot, but it's used in a very narrow sense, because I think it's actually a very sort of rich and creative concept if it's used in, in its broader sense. Um, but I think it's important from an economic point of view that we acknowledge that this idea of resilience is inconsistent with modern management techniques, such as just-in-time production and lean planning and so on, where the whole point of the way you organise an economic system is to only have just exactly as much as what you need, and you centralise a system, and you make systems efficient by shutting down hospitals, let's say, or by having only one railway line. And it, what we know is that the shocks that climate change will bring will need us to have redundant systems, what, what current management techniques would think of as redundant systems, but we're going to need those because we don't know where the shocks are going to come. It was Beeching's decision to centralise transport on fewer routes that led to this situation here, with the southwest being cut off from the rest of the country for several months at least by rail. And where would we be with our just-in-time deliveries if se severe weather events prevented ships from unloading at our ports? It's nice to be amongst geographers because you all knew where the ports were anyway. But um, I, I, I show this map as a bit of a joke in a way because it's totally obvious where all the ports are. They're all at sea level, right? And that's, that's what we know. One of the first changes that we know is coming with climate change is actually sea level rise. And a lot of these ports are going to be vulnerable to that. We're particularly vulnerable in Britain because most of our imports come in through just three ports that are on the southeast of, of the country. And that's the part that's most vulnerable to sea level rise. So... As we depend more on these global food supply chains, we are making ourselves more vulnerable at just the time when we know that shocks will come and we need to have much more resilient systems. Okay, so what I, what I do in my book, The Bioregional Economy, is I try to think about how we might rethink our economy if we were taking the sorts of changes that climate change is bringing to us seriously and, imply, and taking them making them relevant when we're doing our economic planning. 
So, I mean, you could debate for a long time about exactly what level of carbon dioxide emissions we need to achieve. You know, is it going to be 80%, is it going to be 85%, is it going to be 90%? And people do that. But I think all of those are so massively more than anything like what we're achieving at the moment that, you know, a stab in the dark somewhere around there is probably good enough. So I follow the Zero Carbon Britain report version one and the Tyndale Centre in thinking about 90% carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 as being what we need to achieve. And once you say that to people, their next move is always to say, oh, well, what we're going to do is create a new technology that will enable us to carry on with the same sort of economy we've got, but just reduce our reliance on energy in doing that. So my next graphic comes from Tim Jackson's book, Prosperity Without Growth. And the purpose of his book, really, was to say that that kind of sort of mental... Um, well, fantasy, I would say, that technology will somehow resolve this is actually not demonstrated by the evidence. So this is quite a complex graphic. It's got a lot of information going on in there. But um, what it's basically doing is it's showing you how much carbon dioxide it takes to produce $1 worth of output at the moment, and it's comparing that with a range of future scenarios. So this is back to 2007. Here we are in Britain. We're fairly energy efficient already, so it takes us 347 grams of carbon dioxide to produce $1 worth of output. Japan produces more for less, apparently. We could talk about how we do this later on if you want, because it very much depends what you produce and how industrial it is, obviously. But anyway, if we just move forward now to, um, to a number of different scenarios in 2050, we can see the massive improvements in energy efficiency we need to achieve if we're going to keep the same lifestyle. So let's just look at scenario three. Let's assume that the human population by 2050 has risen to 9 billion people. And we're making another assumption, which I, I take as axiomatic, probably a lot of people wouldn't, but that's to say that everybody on the planet deserves an equal level of lifestyle. So if there's energy cuts to be made, everybody takes an equal share. So if you, if you make those two assumptions, then scenario three down here, that, that tells you that by 2050, you have to be able to produce a dollar's worth of value with just 14 um, grams of carbon dioxide. So you've got to move from somewhere around 347 to somewhere around 14. Now, that's an absolutely massive improvement in energy efficiency. And we're just not coming anywhere close to that. And there's other evidence in his report and in his book that shows you that. So, so this idea that somehow we'll just decouple economic growth from um, energy and materials use, there's no evidence that that's the case. It is happening, and it's really important that it's happening, and I would celebrate that, but it's not happening anything like fast enough to enable us to carry on with the same kind of economy that we've got. So I think it's irresponsible to, to live in the hope of this sort of future techno fix and what we need to do instead is to address the kind of lifestyles we're living and the energy intensity of those lifestyles and we also need to change the structure of the economy so we don't have these massive lengthy supply chains that in themselves are very energy efficient inefficient I mean so that's what I'm that's basically what I try and do in my book I try and think through what that kind of economy might look like um, if it was actually a nicer place to live than the one we've got now that's what I'm so it's a bit of a sales job really which I haven't got time to go through in detail here but what I'm trying to achieve is the best possible level of well-being for the least possible throughput of materials and energy. That, that, I think, is the job of a green economist, really, that first bullet point. And it's also very important that we do this now, because the longer we leave this, the more we're going to end up in that situation where a smaller amount of resources are being fought over by a larger number of people. And we need to do this in, a, in an economically and politically participatory way, I believe, because you need to get people to engage in this process. And at the moment, what's tending to happen is that people who already have wealth and power are using that to protect their advantageous position. So we can imagine a future where we, we have some people living in high energy domes. Well, this is, this is the future of Margaret Atwood's book. What's it called? Who's read that book? Um, the Year of the Flood. Where you know some people live in these amazing domes and carry on with the lifestyle we've got, but the other people have an extremely unpleasant lifestyle. And, so that, that kind of authoritarian future possibly lies ahead of us if we don't start making plans soon, I think. And obviously focusing the economy on quality rather than quantity. So we think about the quality of human relationships, the quality of our environments and our relationship with our environments rather than just getting hold of a lot more material stuff. 
So that's um, really just a summary of what I do in my book because I haven't got much time to go into that now and I wanted to talk a little bit more about food and land. So we're here in 2014, the centenary of the First World War, and I think it's very much drawn attention, at least in my mind, to our lack of food security. And that was actually a source of extreme concern at the beginning of the First World War. And um, you can see why here, because you can see the, the very low rates of self-sufficiency in food that we had at that time. Just about 40% of our food was, was produced in our own country. You can see it didn't improve much up to the Second World War, and then since then we have had much. We have had more of a focus on domestic food um, production because of the concerns over actually national security. And although we associate the whole idea of dig for victory with the with the Second World War, actually all of that movement started with the First World War when it first became apparent that our way of dealing with our need for provisions was leaving us very vulnerable in, in a situation of conflict. So the slide provides evidence of the historical evolution of our self-provisioning as a nation state. It shows the proportion of food that was produced within our own territory from the period before the Industrial Revolution until the present. It's not, I think, an accident that the periods of our minimum reliance on our own production coincide with those times when we were most dominant in geopolitical terms. I'm talking of us, the Brits now, for people that aren't Brits. The colonial era certainly expanded the range of foodstuffs available, and coffee, sugar, and tea in particular added greatly to the Englishman's personal satisfaction, to the extent that he would have been willing to spend 10% or more of his income on sugar and tea by 1800. The innovation that made the UK the most powerful nation in the world in the 18th and 19th centuries was preceded by financial innovations that made the investment in global trade possible. From the perspective of a bioregionalist, one might argue that in Britain, our dislocation from the local environment in the sense of accessing our basic resources dates back to exactly this period. And to me, what we need to do now is to sort of unlearn that idea that we don't need to depend on our own soil and that it's actually more efficient to, to create money and buy products produced somewhere else. The UK's insecurity in terms of food provisioning is exacerbated by the weak position of the pound on world financial markets, a weakness that results from the failure of our financial sector, which was the basis of the generation of foreign earnings that were used to fund the import of food. This slide compares the UK situation with that of a range of leading industrialised nations. I think the most striking thing is the comparison of the food deficit of China and the UK. It shows that although China has something like 150 times as many people as the UK, the sizes of our national food production gaps are approximately equivalent. Of course, the main difference is that China is the world's leading manufacturing nation and hence has products to, exchange, to trade in exchange for goods. The figure also indicates that the other nations still have healthy food surpluses, that of the USA being particularly notable. Food and Agriculture Organization data. The UK is in a particularly vulnerable situation, the result of an economic policy that has focused on the knowledge economy and made Britain a world leader in financial services at a time when that sector is shrinking rapidly. The resulting, what's called the weightless economy, is fine in theory, but as the value of the pound falls and food imports become more expensive, British consumers are likely to learn about its practical limitations. The government's unconcerned about this, in 2003, DEFRA had a report, um, and in that they, they, quoted, they were quoted as saying, food security is neither necessary nor is it desirable. And by 2006, they'd moved on to the reassuring statement in what was called an evidence and analysis paper, which suggested that we should still rely on global food markets to feed UK citizens. The conclusion was, as a rich country, questionable in my view, open to trade, the UK is well placed to access sufficient foodstuffs through a well-functioning world market. This cheerful optimism from 2006 <laughs> looks rather different after the financial crisis, I would suggest. Yeah. In a policy brief produced by the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2009, they drew attention to the sorts of food price surges that you can see illustrated in this slide. In spite of the theoretical arguments from neoclassical economists that resources need not be a central concern, it appears that this view is no longer shared by the global management consultants. In an interesting historic twist, 
they are again casting their eyes on virgin land, what they call virgin land, and making arguments about the inefficiency of its use. And these are very similar. They parallel in a very interesting way the sorts of arguments that were made during the period of the English enclosures, particularly in the 18th century. The McKinsey report, called Resource Revolution, considers the change underway globally in land ownership and land use patterns, and it considers this to be the next agro-industrial revolution. The report argues that over the past 100 years as a whole, demand for resources grew more slowly than GDP. The reason for this is that a declining share of global income was devoted to resource-intensive consumption. They identify a new era now that we're moving into, with a multiplicity of what they call resource-related shocks, and rises in commodity prices that will offset the declines in those prices as a result of increased efficiency of, of extraction. And we're already beginning to see, I mean, you can see here the spikes in, in food prices of these basic food crops in 2008. I mean, it's questionable how much this is about speculative movements because now that the commodities markets are open to the sorts of financial products that you know, previously were just in, in the domain of finance, you can actually create these enormous surges just as a result of people basically gambling on, on the value of different commodities. Obviously, that has a huge impact if you're somebody that has to buy these commodities to survive. What's interesting about the McKinsey report, I think, is that its analysis is quite similar to what's been offered by green and ecological economists for a few decades now. It's the prescription that's entirely different. In a section of the report called The Private Sector Opportunity, the authors indicate the way that corporations can manage risk and solve the resource challenges identified through increasing productivity. Technical and managerial methods, they claim, will solve the challenge of inefficiency posed by traditional economies in the areas of the world where resources are still plentiful. The role of government in those countries is to be limited to establishing a price for carbon that enables companies to continue to engage in their activities and be subsidised for protecting ecosystem services. I haven't got time to, to go into that phrase. I just use it in inverted commas, but we'll leave it at that. Um, no mention is made of the issues of ownership of resources, although it's made clear that action will be necessary to ensure that sufficient capital is available to address market failures associated with property rights, incentives issues, and innovation. So just in my view, there's a strong parallel here between our own alienation from the land during the period of enclosures and what's happening to subsistence farmers across the world today. So just as in the 18th century, those who would seek to privatise resources currently held in common justify this on the basis of greater efficiency. Then, as now, the role of politicians was limited to freeing up the market, making capital available, guaranteeing the property rights of those who are now enclosing the land and providing safety nets for the very poor people who, it's acknowledged, may lose their livelihoods. This discussion in the McKinsey report is a sophisticated and intellectually justified version of what is referred to amongst campaigners and academics alike as land grabbing. So although evidence, there, there's not that good evidence about how much land is actually being controlled now and, and being taken into the ownership of, basically into the ownership of agribusinesses actually. But this is a very serious issue across the poorer countries of the world. And the development organizations that would once have focused on um, actually delivering aid and sometimes cash aid or food aid are now focused much more on enabling people in those countries to, to maintain control of their own land. I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a minute. If we accept McKinsey's arguments that basic resources such as land and water will come under increasing pressure in the remainder of this century, then we are forced to address the question of whether the allocation of these resources should be controlled by corporations within a market system, or whether, as the bioregional economy proposal suggests, they should be considered the property of local people who inhabit the land. Perhaps the most fundamental basis for making this decision is on the basis of which system is most likely to meet human need most effectively. At least that's how I would make the decision. As Mary Meller argues, this requires us to ask fundamental questions about the motivations and relevance of the globalised economic system as currently structured. I'm going to quote her now. She says, while capitalism is not concerned with supplying the necessities of life, it is based on institutions engaged in denial of access to the means of sustenance for the majority, so that the minority can pursue power and status through predatory competition. Central to capitalism is the privatization of resources for sustenance. 
Challenging and changing property ownership and the capitalist economy will not be easy. It is a powerful structure with vested interests, but it is also a structure that has absorbed wants as well as needs. I think that the publication of the report by McKinsey in 2012 was a sign that the legal battle for ownership of land on a global basis is now underway. And um, just to give you some statistics about what's actually happening, the World Bank reported in September 2010 that the ownership of 45 million hectares of land was transferred under these, these processes of, of land grabbing. 48.8% of the land of the Democratic Republic of Congo now belongs to foreign owners, largely agribusinesses. And Grain, which is a campaign group working in this area, suggests that um, there have been 416 recent land grabs by foreign investors and 35 million hectares of land is involved in 66 different countries. So it's, it's happening on a massive scale. It's actually happening as well in, in Europe. And um, parts of Central Europe uh, are now being bought by wealthier people in, in the Western states of Europe. Um, yeah, so as, as the West, as, a, as we in the West with our high energy lifestyles, are concerned to preserve those lifestyles, we can move on to see land, land that belongs to poorer people and therefore has less economic value, as a sink for the emissions that we produce when we burn energy. The first phase of this was the clean development mechanism that was agreed in Kyoto. But land has also been seized to grow biofuels as a substitute for the, more, for the increasingly expensive petroleum products. Grano, a campaign, group that represents, a campaign group representing subsistence farmers, says that 17 million hectares of land have been monopolized by global agribusiness to produce fuel crops between 20, 2002 and 2012. Much of this land is in some of the world's poorest countries, and it has been diverted from the production of subsistence for local people to crops to produce energy for our, our fuel-hungry lifestyles. Attempts to create a market exchange between those who seek trees to absorb their excessive carbon emissions and those whose environments available to them in exchange for cash. Oh, where am I going? <laughs> for, yeah, sorry, turn the page. That's always a good idea. For example, under the clean development mechanism that I've already described, have met with only limited success. The, the research into these systems shows that although the idea was that, that they would receive large amounts of cash in return for their land, the, the outcome has been that a certain number of middlemen have done pretty well out of it, but the, the consequence has been subsistence farmers losing access to their land. The result of that has been the suggestion of this idea of food sovereignty and new campaigns about food sovereignty, largely in the, what we think of as the poorer countries of the world, but also to some extent in, in this country as well. And I, I see the sale of the co-op farms as a, a crucial issue here, which should be resisted on the basis of food sovereignty arguments. This is the logo of La Via Campesina, which is one of the leading campaigning organizations in the area of food sovereignty. So food sovereignty, it focuses on food for people rather than commodities markets and food that's sold in commodity markets and food that you buy um, for cash, which you then need to earn. The focus is on people having access to land to produce their own food. It's also important to value food providers. I mean, in Britain, you know, peasant is actually a dirty word, isn't it? It's kind of a, an insult to call somebody a peasant. But this is an attempt to sort of rehabilitate the idea of a peasant and to value the role that people play in growing food. I've already mentioned localised food systems. I don't think that's news to anybody here. It's about resilience. It's also about energy efficiency. <coughs> Putting control locally. Very much an emphasis on building knowledge and skills, I think. Um, that's important as well, valuing what local people know about their own crops. And of course, part of that is growing a wider range of crops. So if you're producing crops that are part of a commodity market, then that leaves you more vulnerable to changing prices of those crops. But if you depend on something like sorghum that doesn't tend to be traded, then you actually have a much more resilient, resilient access to, to the food that you need. And obviously working with nature is an important part of this rather than setting up the huge sort of the other side of the agribusiness activity, which is very energy intensive and resource intensive production. So what do I think this, obviously it's kind of easy to argue that in countries where a large number of people still live in that close relationship with the land. But what would that sort of transformation look like in our own country? Well, I think it's, it's, it's useful to think about the idea of rebalancing and re-embedding in this concept, in, in this context. And 
Western societies, particularly Britain, because we were the first to go through the process of enclosure and um, to move into a global food economy, and Western societies like ours have been divorced from this recognition of our dependence on the soil and on the local land since the 17th century, and it's been an increasing process of divorce since then. Since then, we have been effectively exploiting the land of others in other countries to meet our needs, first through the, the system of colonialism and then through an unequal trading system. Now, academically, it's very useful that we have Polanyi here making these arguments about the pre-market economies and how it's actually the market economy that is the more unnatural system. So he views the economy as primarily social, and he actually refers to the market economy as a utopian myth, not because he thinks it's an ideal system, but because it's a system that can never really exist. Actually, economic relationships are primarily social, he would argue. And not only are traditional economies embedded in social relationships, they're also very much embedded in the land and in their local environments. So as he argues here, the economy is an element of nature inextricably interwoven with man's institutions. And, um, yeah, uh, so, so Polanyi is useful from an academic point of view, but I think practically we can also get a lot of inspiration from the Transition Towns movement and those local movements that are starting to think about our relationship with land and our relationship with food and with our other resources as well. And um, I don't know if you're following, especially people on Twitter, what's happening in Germany with the energy vendor, the energy transition. It's, it's hugely inspiring, I think. And I think what we can see very clearly is the contrast in the level of political leadership that there is in Germany. So they've set themselves really impressive targets for moving to renewable energy systems. Uh, I think it's phasing out all fossil fuel electricity generation by 2030, can that be right? It's quite extraordinary. When you say it, you can't really believe it. Um, and they're shutting down their nuclear power stations much more rapidly than that. So, but the main point about it is they're doing it with public engagement. And um, I think it's, it's actually a tragedy in this country that while these opportunities for transition are presenting themselves, it's at the very same time that we're seeing the state actively undermined, particularly, I mean, it's nice coming over the border always to Wales because these things don't apply as much here. But, you know, in England, we're see, I mean, I'm a local councillor and we're seeing nearly half our budget taken away at the very time we need to be engaged in developing renewable energy systems and, and local food systems. So... I have focused quite a lot on food today, but I think that's just because that's the most obvious aspect of that. And it's, you know, eating is something we do every day, so we're very aware of it. But I think these same kind of relationships apply in terms of our access to other resources and particularly our access to energy, because renewable energy can be very local and it can be owned by local people. And in Germany, the number of local energy co-ops has increased tenfold in the past decade. And so when we have these arguments about... Um, you know, energy prices and our energy markets working, you can completely undercut that whole argument by just putting up your own turbine and producing your own electricity and then, you, you know, you don't any longer have to worry about that. So I think that's, that's the direction that actually offers a lot of hope and inspiration right now. So this, this slide shows what remains of local sourcing in my own local economy. I don't mean you can only buy apple juice, you can buy a lot of things where I live because I live in Stroud and it's semi-rural semi anyway. Um, Actually, what we see here is, is the way local sourcing has been revived by citizens who have a pro-environmental attitude. This is actually showing you the stall at our farmer's market of Day's Cottage, a local orchard that produces juices and cider, trying to divert consumption away from or imported orange juice. But the focus of a bioregional economy goes beyond actually the, the amount of energy that's used in these sort of production systems. It's also very much about reconnecting you to your local place. So this chap here, Dave Casper, he's an absolute mine of information on apples. And you can go to his farm, you can see how the apples are grown, you can sit under the apple tree. There's a whole sort of quality of life associated with this sort of consumption that just isn't available when you go to a supermarket. And that's really what I try to focus on my, in my book, trying to say, well, you know, here's a possibility for actually a much better life, a life where you know the person who's produced your food, where you can actually produce your own food as a community, as in a community-supported agriculture system. And um, that offers you opportunities to connect with other people and to connect with your local place, which I think greatly enhance your quality of life. Just quickly to say something about a bioregion for people who don't know. Um, 
a bioregion is a way of thinking about the Earth in terms of natural divisions. We live very much with political divisions. So, you know, why is the border between England and Wales where it is? Partly about the River Severn, but it's also about where battles ended at some time in the past. And a lot of our boundaries are like that. And what the bioregionalists argue is that you can think about your place in terms of natural boundaries. So, as you can see here, it's determ determined by, and the, this should be popular with the geographers here, I really like to hear what geographers think about this, because we don't have our bioregions mapped, except in your country, where they are mapped, and they're used for planning in New Zealand, and in your country, yes, it's quite interesting. In Australia and New Zealand, they are using them. Anyway, you can see it's defined in terms of watersheds, and uh, mountains, so sort of natural definitions of systems. But then beyond that, you start to define them in terms of species, particular marker species, or uh, uh, ecosystems, which obviously support those kind of species. And also, um, ultimately, you get particular human communities growing out of these landforms and these species as well. And um, it's quite interesting that actually my prototype bioregion was the Somerset Levels. I don't know quite what to make of that, that it's all underwater now. But it's quite an easy, easy place to demonstrate what you mean because it's, it's obviously a natural area which is defined by its relationship with water and the particular rivers that are there. But you can also see, because it's got that, that large amount of water, the natural product that, that came from it was actually willow. And so you had natural, um, a natural product which then was, was used in craft in basket making. So traditionally, the, the exports from Somerset to the rest of the country were wicker baskets, which I also make myself. So. There's quite a nice sort of resonance there for me. So if you were thinking about the economy in terms of bioregions, you would be trying to embed yourself within that bioregion and trying to meet your needs for, for your basic resources from within the production of that small area. You would acknowledge the ecological limits of the area you lived within, and you would also try and dispose of your wastes within that area, so creating a sort of circularity there. And the aim would be... Not, you know, not total self-sufficiency. You wouldn't be never allowed to have coffee again, but you would certainly be aiming to look for what you needed from within your local area before you looked further afield. And that's what I mean by this principle of trade subsidiarity. So you start with the local and you only look further afield if you can't find what you need within the bioregion. I just put that there because I like the picture, really. Actually, um, in the summer... This shows how bad the trains are. We actually had the trains closed in my town and there were tomato plants growing in the middle of the track. So that was quite, a, quite symbolic of the disaster of First Great Western. Please sign my petition to have it brought back into public ownership. Um, so when you say this to economists, when you say you, know, you want a much more locally based economy, they immediately use this A word, which is a sort of no-no word in economics, which is autarky. That means you're going to make everybody live like the people do in North Korea. So I can promise you that's not the case. So... Again, you know, repeating, I'm not saying that we wouldn't have any um, trade at all, but actually what trade, trade is now about maximisation of profit. It's not necessarily about improving the range of goods that are available to you. So what we're looking for instead is this kind of cultural openness and maximisation of exchange. But we've got to take into account that if we cut our energy limits in the kind of way I'm talking about, the sorts of travel that we enjoy today are simply not going to be possible because the, the amount of carbon dioxide produced by a single flight is more or less the amount you can have in a whole year. And if everybody on the planet was living in that way, we would basically be fried. So we are talking about quite a different way of assessing what your local place means to you and how you identify yourself on a global basis. And one of the risks from that, of course, is that we will see more tensions between areas. And so we need to try to maximise the cultural openness that we can achieve without massive use of energy. Yeah, and the, the trade will be focused on goods which are not possible to produce locally because uh, of climate reasons or because there's particular specialisms. I mean, that isn't that controversial, I don't think, to say, you know, you produce most, most stuff locally and you trade for what you can't produce. That's how trade always used to be. It's part of globalisation that trade, we now look first to trade rather than looking to local production first. And one of the arguments I make in favour of this kind of way of organising our economy is that it really does help to give you greater accountability. So no doubt you've had that conversation with people where they say, well, there's no point doing anything about climate change because China's building another coal power station every week. Nobody's ever... It's, a, it's an urban myth. Nobody ever produces the evidence about that. But it kind of expresses this idea, we don't know that everybody else is doing their part, so why should we do our part? And I think making you responsible locally for your carbon emissions can really help to bring that sense of accountability. 
And as I say here, if you know, your bioregion is like your backyard, and if everybody looks after their backyard, then ultimately the whole planet will be protected. Yeah, that's what we say, lambies, looking after my backyard. Not nimbies, but lambies. That's what we are in Stroud. Just coming back to what I said earlier about the community farm, this is where I get my vegetables from, Stroud Community Agriculture. I think you've got one of these in Cardiff now, haven't you? Somebody will tell us later. So it's, it's great, but not only because you have, like, two food miles or something, you know, very local production, and, of course, also seasonal food. So you learn to think about food in a different way, and you really look forward to getting a tomato sometime around July or so whenever I get my tomatoes. So it is changing your relationship with food and your relationship with local place. But it's also very much about the social aspects of provisioning, of getting access to what you need. And that's, that's one of the key points, I think, about the kind of economy, the quality of the economy we're looking for, that there will be that aspect of community rather than the sort of rather thin relationship you get through a market exchange. And so that's what we mean by putting the economy in its place. You know, economics is just a small part of your life. Very much at the moment, it's dominating. It's sort of spread out into all areas of our life. And that's really undermining the sorts of human relationships that make us happy as human beings, I would argue. And we need to think of the market. This is something that comes from the degrowth movement, thinking of the market as what they call agora, the Greek word for market, which comes from I think, the Greek word for open. So it, it's a space for public debate, for sharing ideas, for sociability, not just a place for commerce. Oh, that's just nice pictures of the, of the community farm, really. Oh, yes, I was going to tell you something about it. It's, it's, it's built on cooperation and mutual support for the risks and rewards of farming, which are shared between the farmers and the consumers. Um, the consumers commit to supporting the farm and providing a fair income for the farmers. The farmers can then develop the health and fertility of the farm, its wildlife and environment. All the produce from the farm is shared between the supporting consumers and it's sold only if there's a surplus. I think we probably did have a surplus of squash there. Um, we rent 46 acres of land and employ two and a half farmers and we feed 185 families throughout the year. So it's, it's small scale, but it's, it's just a very... It's a very positive, I think, way to provide your need for vegetables and it um, would be nice to hear more about what happens in Cardiff. I think this is my last one now, Seeds of a Greener Future. But this is something we do in Transition Stroud every year. It's very blurry, actually. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, this is Potato Day, which we've just had. And it's, it's kind of trying to address that problem we have with this kind of work of transitioning to a sustainable future, which is that we're all very middle class, basically. Um, so we, we sort of sat down in our transition town group and we thought, well, you know, what is it that goes across all the classes? And we thought of three things, football, beer and potatoes. So in the end, we said, well, what we'll do is, is go for potatoes because that's quite easy. So, you know, when the potato season, potato planting season comes along, we, we have this and we set it up in the, you know, most sort of um, mammonish part of the shopping centre and uh, catch a lot of people and encourage them to, to grow potatoes. And it is actually very sociable and all sorts of people get drawn in and start growing potatoes for the first time. And that's, for a lot of people, that's the first time they've had any relationship with the soil at all. Putting a potato in, seeing it grow, having potatoes in the harvesting season. So it's just a positive, a positive message to end on, I think, um, to cheer you up after some of the gloom of earlier on. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.